grab your Bibles tonight and turn to Isaiah chapter 44, where we left off a couple of weeks ago, and a little bit of background uh, and review, and then we'll uh, pick it up uh, just about near the end of the chapter where we ended, but we're looking at a message entitled, His Spirit, that is, His Holy Spirit is our hope, and uh, we saw in verses 1 to 6 that the Holy Spirit is our hope because we learned from the prophet Isaiah that it's God's Spirit that pursues us, and of course, he's speaking to the nation of Israel, But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Paul wrote to the church in Rome that all of the things written previously in the Bible, that is the Old Testament, were written for our learning, and that by our patience, learning the scriptures, we might inherit these promises. When Paul wrote that to the church at Rome, he was talking about us as Gentile believers, again, remember, he's talking to the Romans, Italians, that... God's promises were given to all those who believe in him. So it's quite a remarkable thing. So we look at the book of Isaiah, and we learn in the first few uh, verses that God's spirit is pursuing the nation of Israel, specifically Judah, but he's announcing that he's going to reach out to them again. He's, in fact, not only again, but he's always going to be calling them, Israel, back to himself. And we learn from John chapter 15 that Jesus echoed that eternal truth of God. God says to us tonight that he says, if you trust me, believe in me, know this. You didn't choose me, God says, I chose you. Isn't that a wonderful thing to realize that God chose you? That should bring you comfort tonight. Listen, don't raise your hand, but do you desire to draw near to God? Do you desire to have faith in God? Do you desire to obey the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen, you and I have that passion not because of any doing of our own. It's because God has drawn us to himself. And if that is your desire, you can take a big, deep breath and relax knowing that what God has begun to do in your life, he will complete it. He will finish that all the way to the end. And I am so grateful that God doesn't do things halfway. He does it all the way. He finishes what he begins. He's not human like us. My house is full of half-baked projects. My closet is half cleared out. And by the time I get to this end of the closet, the, 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 the part I had cleaned originally is all messed up again. Not God. He just completely plods along in your life and in my life to get the job done. And we saw various things about that, and we took great comfort in how God speaks to the people of Israel that in the end, there's going to be a remnant that he saves. There will be a believing remnant of Israel. We saw in verses 7 to 20 that his Holy Spirit protects, that his Spirit protects by exposing false religions and deities. And we learned from that regarding discernment. And God is announcing that his sovereign. God's the creator. All other gods are false. And uh, he alone stands true. And we would think, well, of course that's true. But we're going to see in our closing arguments tonight regarding this chapter, and if by God's mercy we get into the opening few verses of chapter 45, we'll do that. But in verses 21 to 22, we'll pick it up there together. God's Holy Spirit is also this for us. It's, It's because that his spirit feels. Now, listen to this. In verse 21, It says, remember these, that is, truths, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant and I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. Remember, church, God says this. Keep your eye on Isaiah 44, 21, between now and probably the end of this year with what's brewing in the Middle East. God says, I will not forget you. Some of you are aware. I can hear some of you out there saying, yep, that's right. Watch the news regarding what's taking place with Israel right now. They're almost surrounded by very lethal enemies at this hour. All this week, today's Wednesday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, tapering off today, Israel's largest military practice, what do you want to call it, maneuvers uh, in over 20 years they've been conducting because uh, they are locked and loaded. They, they've got to be ready. Why? Because the, the presence of Hezbollah, and Iran, Iran, Syria, Russia, surrounding them right now is extensive. Right now, as I stand here before you, right now, as morning dawns uh, in Israel, the Golan Heights, there are, 
Some have estimated, a th- I don't even know if Israel owns a thousand tanks, but innumerable amount of tanks right now, practicing, going through maneuvers. Uh, remarkable what's taking place. And uh, they're getting ready. Just Google it later. Uh, Iran, Israel, Hezbollah, war looming. I'm not making this up. It's, it's remarkable. Why am I saying this? God says, I will not forget you, O Israel. Remarkable times. And remember, we're saying this after 2,000 years of Israel not being a nation, and now they're back into the land again. God is making this announcement. We want to be very careful that we do not discount what God is saying regarding his people. He goes on in verse 22. He says, I have blotted out. This is remarkable. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions. I want you to underline that in your Bible. In fact, I want to be a little lovingly sarcastic to you right now. When did that happen? This is, listen, this is written in 700 B.C. What is God saying? I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions? Really? And like a cloud your sins? When did that happen? This is why Isaiah is mentioned as the evangelical prophet. The prophet is possessed by the Holy Spirit speaking about, listen everybody, I hope this brings you comfort. He's speaking about a future event that is yet to take place, that Isaiah prophesies more about it than any Old Testament prophet, about a day coming when Israel's sins will be blotted out. That is, believing Israel. Well, when were your sins blotted out? Listen, I came to the Lord on June 20th, 1977. Listen, theologians, listen. Were my sins blotted out on June 20th, 1977, according to the Bible? Good answer. I heard it loud and clear. Somebody said no. He's exactly correct. Isn't that weird? Listen, in the book of Ephesians, it tells us that God, in advance, knowing what he was going to do through Christ at the cross, he saved us even before the cross ever happened. You say, wait a minute, that's freaking me out. It should freak you out. You and I came to faith in Christ on some certain day. Do you remember that? Or some of you, like my wife, Lisa, she grew, she's, she's never known what it's like to not believe in Jesus. So she can't say what I can say. I came to faith in Christ in one day when I heard the gospel. She's never known what it's like to not know the gospel. Maybe you're like that. God bless you if that's the knowledge you have had. I, I wish I would have had that upbringing. Whatever the case is, How is it, listen theologians today, tonight, how is it that Christ saved you when he did? How is it that God saved you when he did? And the answer is theologically on the basis of the cross. That's how you're saved tonight, on the basis of the cross. But in the mind of God, when did Christ go to the cross? It wasn't 2,000 years ago. Before the mind of God, before Adam and Eve was ever formed, God, who is eternal, knew the answer of redemption before Adam and Eve were ever created. And he went through with the deal. You say, how would God, why would God know he knows everything? Why would he create Adam and Eve knowing that they were going to blow it? Because he knows all things. He can't learn anything. God cannot be taught anything. He knows all in eternity. Why would he go through with the deal knowing that those two first kids of his would blow it? And the answer is, that's why. The answer is, that's why. He went through with the deal, knowing that he would redeem his kids who would fall away from him on the basis of innocent blood. Not the blood of animals, bulls and goats, but the, anim- but the blood of his own son, not of animals. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. So when God says to Israel through the prophet, I've blotted out your sins, it doesn't, listen, it doesn't mean that Israel is nationally saved, that just because you're Hebrew, you're automatically saved. Didn't Jesus say to Nicodemus, who was a Jew, what did Jesus, did Jesus evangelize to him? Yes, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nick, unless you're born again, you're not going to make it to heaven. How was a Jew saved tonight, anybody? You got to be born again if you're Jewish tonight. No, no, no. I'm Jewish, I go. No, you Jewish, you not go. <laughs> no, no. A Jew has to go the same way as a Gentile. God says, I am God, I've created all, and there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And besides, if you want to get in a fight about this, I'll take you on right now about this one. 
The first Jew that ever was, was first a Gentile before he was a Jew. See how excited I am? I'm going like this about it. <laughs> Abram was a Gentile before he became a Jew. How do you become a real Jew? Oh, the answer is both in the Old Testament and in the New. By the way, listen, spiritually, you realize something in here in this room? No, there's some Jewish people in this room. There's some, what's, what we'd say, Messianic believers or believers. We'd call them believers. In Israel, believers call themselves believers. They don't call themselves Christians. And that's cool. I like that. They call themselves believers. But here's the deal. Romans chapter 1 tells us, or Romans chapter 2, excuse me, tells us that he is not a Jew who is circumcised outwardly of the flesh, but he who is a true Jew is the one who has been circumcised on the inward parts of his heart, whose praise is not from men. Oh, you're so religious. God says, nope, not accepting that. But whose, listen, whose praise is from God. Wow, how do you receive God's acceptance tonight? Christ. From Old to New Testament, God blots out sin and transgressions by the sacrifice of innocence. There is no one more innocent than his only glorified son, Christ Jesus. Isn't it remarkable that the prophet speaks? And listen, think about it. Now put on your prayer shawl or put on your your yarmulke, and be Jewish for a second. And you're reading today, imagine today, 21st century, you're Jewish, and you're reading the, your prophet Isaiah, and you come to this verse 22 of chapter 44, and you read, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins return to me, for I have redeemed you. Is that not in the Bible? If you're Jewish tonight, how do you answer that verse? I would have to ask you, wouldn't this verse trump temple worship? Wouldn't this verse trump sacrificial animals? Red heifer, Passover lamb? Ladies and gentlemen, are you with me? Think of it. God says, I have, in the past tense, blotted out. That means it took innocence. I, I would ask when. Isn't it amazing that back in Genesis, starting in chapter 15, reading forward, God tells Abraham on Mount Moriah, I will provide. He speaks through Abraham to Isaac, and God says, I believe Abraham's acting as a prophet at that moment. When, when, when Isaac says, Father, here's the wood, here's the fire, where's the sacrifice? And the old King James serves it up the most accurate. The Lord will provide himself the sacrifice. Do you hear that? Awesome. That's how your sins are blotted out tonight. By Christ. Listen, the price has been paid 21 centuries ago. Just like Isaiah in his day is looking ahead to the future. You and I look back and in the, as it were in the, in the middle of the timeline of humanity is the cross. Abraham looked ahead, you and I look back. We all looked at the same point. It's the cross, the cross, the cross. Christ died on the cross. Exactly as the prophets foretold, he would die as a sacrifice. It's absolutely awesome. Just think of it. How bold should we be then regarding our salvation and how comfortable should we be? Absolutely. How do we lead people to Christ if we're insecure about our own salvation? Stop, listen, I mean this to you and I. We need to stop valuing our salvation based upon our performance. Oh, I didn't pray much today. I'm a loser. I'm probably going to go to hell if Jesus doesn't come back. <laughs> you, you would make a great cult member of some group then. <laughs> it's all about works for you, right? Listen, listen, I know, I know the flesh feels better when we give more or, or serve more or pray more and we feel more accepted. Do you know that's a fallacy? His love is not human love. Well, I don't know if I like you today. Just stay away from me. You've upset me today. Do you know God's not like that? It's hard for us to grasp that because we are so performance-based people. He loves you. He has set his seal upon you. Think of that. Do you trust Christ tonight? I didn't ask you how much you trust him. Do you trust him? Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? God says, I've blotted out your sins. You want to fight with him about it? I, I suggest you be quiet. <laughs> Let him win. 
Believe him. He's awesome. And then in verses 23 to 28, his spirit is our hope because his spirit is, frankly, his spirit is eternal. Verse 23, sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. (laughs) That's awesome. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord, notice in your Bible, it's all capital letters, Yah. That's the name of God. This is not the word God. And this is not a Lord as master. This is his name. For Yah has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Remarkable. I see John's wearing tonight the Ezekiel 38. Is that what you got? Ezekiel 38 and 39 on your shirt? Right here in my notes tonight. You can look at them later online. I've got uh, just in parentheses Ezekiel 36 to 39. God says in Ezekiel 36 to 39, by the way, we're very close. We've never been this close in the history of mankind to the fulfillment of the Ezekiel fulfillment. Read it. You need home. This is your homework. Go read Ezekiel 36, 7, 8, and 9. You look at that and you, you look at what's happening in the world around us and it's, it's never been closer. But God says, well, just watch this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glorify myself in Israel. Now, there may be some of you here tonight or some of you watching and, and uh, you're a product of uh, modern day college campuses, anti-Israel, anti uh Israel nation, anti-Jew. There's a lot of that in college campuses uh, today. It it's just goes with all the other lunacy that's on campus. Uh, parents, by the way, I'm a firm believer. You ought to dry up the money stream to the, to the universities. I'm dead serious. Cut them off. Just cut them off. You, where, where do I send my kid to college? I don't know anymore. Maybe the Khan Academy might be a good place. Khan, K-H-A-N. Maybe the Khan Academy, I don't know. But you understand, if you're going to... I forget the prices. Please forgive me for being off. I'm sure I'm going to be way lowball because I'm an old guy. But if you're going to send your kid to Columbia or to Harvard or to Stanford and spend, what is it, 100000 bucks a year? Maybe, maybe $200,000? I don't know what it is. What, what are you going to pay for? What are you buying? You're buying the professor's opportunity to indoctrinate your kid on that professor's political worldview. You think you're going to get a really decent electrical engineer now out of Stanford? Not anymore. No, you're going to get a kid that's full of political jargon and craziness. Do you want your, listen, don't send your kid to college to learn all about how ridiculous you are and your Christian worldview. That's what kids are doing. Look it up. I don't know what the answer is, but if if I had unlimited funds, I would not be sending my kid to Harvard. It is an absolute disgrace, which I always love to say this. I wouldn't be sending my kids to a Christian university founded by a Christian pastor whose name was John Harvard. Did you know that? Harvard University was a seminary for pastors founded by John Harvard. Samuel Adams, John Adams, the whole Adams family went there. (laughs) Everybody went there. Did you know that? Did you know Yale was a Christian university? Princeton, Christian university. Did you know they all went nuts? Now they're anti-Christian. That was my little rant. It was nowhere in my notes. I just felt very (laughs) possessed to do that, but... Verse 24, for thus says the Lord, that's Yah again, your Redeemer. Isn't that beautiful? He who has formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things. I love God when he flexes. I've made all things. (laughs) Watch. Who stretches out. Any astronomers in here? Listen, this is awesome. Who stretches out the heavens all alone. This word stretches out in the Hebrew. Watch this, everybody. It wasn't wasn't until not too long ago that we discovered that the universe is what? Constricting or expanding? expanding. God says in the, in the Hebrew language, in Isaiah 44, I've stretched it out. I flung it out, and it's still being flung. NASA, JPL, figures that out. Oh, I love it. God says, I did that. Get your Hubble, get your telescopes, get your science, get your, all your stuff out there. You're going to find out. Watch. You're going to f- listen. You're going to find out that it's moving outward And now you're faced with a dilemma. 
Ninth grade science has got to answer this question. If it's moving out, stop the movement and roll back the hands of time and make it go backwards because you can't tell where you're going unless you first find out where you've come from. So stop the mechanics, the astrophysics, roll back, put it through a computer model. If we're moving, I forget what the numbers are. Many of you are so much smarter than this. We, you know, just, but by the time, 24 hours from today, all of the mechanisms in motion, the, the earth spinning, our, our galaxy, our system all moving. It's, I think it's something like one million miles. We will have all moved in movements 24 hours from right now. The spot that this globe is in right now in space, it will never be visited again. And we're moving outward and we haven't hit the wall yet at the end. And God says, and yet, listen, all things physical are limited. Are you sitting down? Think of this for a moment. All things physical are limited. How old is the earth? How old is the universe? I don't know, neither do you. I just know this, we haven't hit the end yet. But all things physical are limited. And God says, I made it all. He's just looking at it like it's a little goober right here in the, he's just like, and we think we're something. Look at us, God, we've got it. And we look like a mouse on a basketball. Hey, God, look at us, we got it all in control. And, and, and he looked from heaven, and he, he, can see, he can see the beginning and the end. And he's going, what is that noise coming out of that blue ball <laughs> down there? Hey, God, let me tell you how to run the universe. It's actually hilarious. God says, I've done it all. I've done it all. Who spreads abroad the earth by himself or by myself. <laughs> Verse 25. Oh, this is, hang on to your seats. I'm going to get in trouble tonight. Verse 25, who frustrates the signs of the babblers. Some of your Bible translations in the margins have words like this. Who frustrates the signs of the forecasters. I'm not talking weather. These are, these are uh, uh, self-appointed prognosticators. God says, I frustrate those who make stuff up, and I didn't say it. And drives diviners, those who... See things that are not. Listen. He says, I'm, I, I drive them mad. Why? Because the things that they say don't come to pass. They're forecasters. But what they forecast doesn't happen. God says, I frustrate those people. I like that. And then he says, to those who make stuff up, I drive them nuts who turns wise men, this is a sarcasm, these are not like wise men like the magi, these are self-appointed people who say things like this. Um, I have an inside track on this. Let me tell you what it means. Now you won't understand anything about this unless you buy my book. <laughs> now please listen, I, we laugh at that and we should laugh at that, but it's also very dangerous because there are people who do buy those books. And there's something about people. Did anybody remember the late Dr. Walter Martin? One of the great, great theologians of our time. Loved him. I had a chance to see him many times speak at Calvary Costa Mesa and Newport Mesa Christian Center. Was, he was amazing. I loved that guy. I've never seen anybody more bold in my life. He was amazing. Dr. Walter Martin said, there are people who just do not have an appetite for truth. They can't see, they can't see the truth. They're not interested in the truth but they're very religious people. They love religion of whatever sorts, but they don't want the truth. And he said something I've never forgotten. He said, you should thank God for the cult that's down the street. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> and he said, because if those religious people were not at that cult down the street, they would be in your church. <laughs> people in your church with no appetite for truth. You and I have relatives like this, do we not? We know people like this. They're very spiritual, but they have no appetite for truth. God says, I drive them crazy. I drive them mad. I frustrate them. He says that he makes their knowledge foolishness, a mockery. He makes their brilliant insights a joke. 
All right, so I want you guys to look at this video for a second and listen carefully. There's a prophetic news service called unsealed.org that's looking for spiritual significance in the August 21st solar eclipse to see if it's really a sign in the heavens. Unsealed's Gary Ray finds some names of the towns in the path of the eclipse significant. The first major town it's going to cross is uh, Salem, Oregon. Um, and if you recall that uh, there was the, the priest called Melchizedek who was from Salem, which okay, a lot stop, of scholars stop. think was the original name. Stop, just Greek. pause it, pause it for a second. I should have said this. What you're about to hear is not how you're supposed to interpret the Bible. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you want to start it over. But when you hear what you're about to hear, this should get some sort of a, uh, an award in Hollywood. You cannot, ladies and gentlemen, listen, I don't know who that guy is, I don't care to know. You can't do this when you're reading your Bible. Do you understand that? It's the exact same thing as this morning I had a, a scrambled egg and refried bean, bean uh, burrito. Scrambled egg, refried bean burrito. I could have today brought in the tortilla that I just open flamed, heated up, and said, there is on this, can you see it? There is on this, the alignment of the heavens and, or Jesus. Can't you see it? Do you understand what we're saying? Listen, friends, prophecy, Bible prophecy was not given to be some opaque, strange, goofy thing that people can make up for their own interpretation. It is exact, and God gave it clearly. You won't have to guess, and some people uh, uh, won't, you know, oh, I can see it, but the multitudes cannot see it. When God does his signs and wonders, according to the Bible, everybody sees what's happening, and they get it. Okay, can I drop this on you too? This guy's talking about the eclipse that happened a few weeks ago. If you think for a moment, I should have the ushers just open the door now so people can run out. <laughs> if you think for a moment that a biblical sign and wonder is a NASA, JPL, or astronomers telling you that on such and such a day there's going to be an eclipse and it's going to enter Salem, it's going to fly over Salem, Oregon, which somehow Melchizedek must have lived there, must have had a condo there in a fishing boat. <laughs> the Prince of Salem, from the Bible, and it's going to go out of South Carolina, and it's going to go across these cities. Listen, if, if that's a sign and wonder that is predicted by JPL or NASA, I would submit to you tonight, tonight that that's not a sign and wonder. What? If you want to say that these moons are going to look like they're turning blood, like because there's going to be this kind of an eclipse, that is not a sign or a wonder. They're, ladies and gentlemen, listen, they're called signs and wonders. Do you know what that means? That means you can't predict it. It means that God will blot out the sun with no moon passing in front of it. God's going to go, booyah, boom, right, boom. God's going to make the moon without, any, without NASA being able to explain it. That's a sign and wonder. Have the moon turn red without any volcanic ash or any other uh, naturally explainable event, and now you got my attention. Are you hearing me? This is important. Now, I don't know what we're going to do with this clip now, but... There's a prophetic news service called unsealed.org that's looking for spiritual significance in the August 21st solar eclipse to see if it's really a sign in the heavens. Unsealed's Gary Ray finds some names of the towns in the path of the eclipse significant. The first major town it's going to cross is uh, Salem, Oregon. Um, and if you recall that uh, there was the, the priest called Melchizedek who was from Salem, which a lot of scholars think was the original name for Jerusalem. August 21st, the sun goes dark behind the moon over the west coast. The same moment it sets or goes dark on Jerusalem. Uh, Salem is the shortened version of Jerusalem. So just the fact that the first major town it's going to cross is called Salem, I think should at least get our attention that God's trying to say something about uh, Jerusalem and Israel and what's coming. The baby Jesus' arrival was heralded by a sign in the heavens. The star of Bethlehem, the wise men, or Magi, followed. The names of these cities that the eclipse 
crosses almost tell us to, to pay attention because uh, one of the next towns that crosses is called Wiser, Idaho. Wiser is German for wise man. Oh, there you um, go. Another town is called, uh, it, well, it's Casper, Wyoming, and Casper is the Chaldean traditional term for magi or wise man. Seven years later, the same length as the prophesied tribulation, another total solar eclipse goes the opposite direction over the U.S., and the paths of the two eclipses form a cross. Just the fact that there would be two total solar eclipses um, in the most powerful, most influential, most prosperous Gentile nation on Earth um, is, is very significant. Where the eclipses meet is actually in southern Illinois, in that region. If you're from that area, you know it's it's called uh, Little Egypt. Um, and the precise town where the paths meet is called is Makanda. And uh, the old motto for that town was the Star of Egypt. So it's interesting. There's there's you know it's almost like God's saying Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. Well, what could that mean? Egypt was hit with horrible plagues for defying God and Moses. If you go back to the book of Exodus and look at the 10 plagues, seven of those 10 plagues are repeated on a worldwide scale in the book of Revelation. During the tribulation tell period. tell people that we're not saying that the rapture or the second coming is gonna happen at such and such a date. We're just saying that the Lord multiple times commanded his people to watch. And he gave signs for a reason. If he didn't want us to pay attention, he wouldn't have given signs. CBN News doesn't necessarily endorse all the conjectures made at unsealed.org, but thought that you'd at least find those presented here interesting to ponder. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Herndon, Virginia. Okay, so the qualifier is signs. The guy at the end said signs. There's not one sign mentioned or in reality of what he just said. Some people who want his words to be true, they listen to this and they go, that's fascinating, that's fantastic. On what basis? You can have 10,000 people view all of that differently and come up with a different conclusion. That's not Bible prophecy. When you go and take this, did you hear at the end that in seven years from now, there's going to be another eclipse? By the way, that is true. There's going to be another eclipse across the United States in seven years. And he said that could mark the beginning. He said the tribulation period is seven years long. What is, what is, how does that connect? What's the connection to that? What are you implying? What are you suggesting? Did you listen to that carefully? You need to watch that later on your own maybe? You cannot abuse the Bible that way. And you cannot look at things and say, well, you know, there's a, there's a town in Salem. What connection does Salem, Oregon have to Melchizedek? in the book of Hebrews and in the book of Genesis. But some people love this stuff because they have no stomach for truth. They want to be sensationalized. This next slide, this is just a slide. So the 23rd of September, next week, yeah? We're being told it's the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 12. You want to have a great time tonight, and I mean this sincerely, start in Revelation chapter 1 and start reading. Because before you get to Revelation 12, you've got to go through 11 chapters. And I want to ask you something. What happened to the 11 chapters? Uh, where's the 144,000? Where are the various events that are taking place on earth? Where's the Antichrist? You've got, the, Revelation chapter 12 is the mid to the latter end of the tribulation period. It's the, it's the last half. Those events recorded in Revelation 12 is the last 1,260 days recorded in the seven-year tribulation period. That's, I'm not making it up. It's scripture. But we're being told by pastors around the world that it's the fulfillment on September 23rd of Revelation 12. Do you understand that for three and a half years you have been in the tribulation period? Right now, well, that explains, Pastor, thank God you've seen the light. That explains the election. That explains the floods. That explains the bad surf we've had lately. And the Do you understand? Where's the seven-year peace treaty that the Bible says the Antichrist is going to sign with, it, uh, with Israel and its neighbors? Where's Daniel 9, 24 to 27? 
Hold, it, hold up your right hand. Everyone hold up your right hand. Let me see your right hand. I don't see it on your right hand. Let me see your forehead. I don't see any marks on your right hand or your forehead. Okay. This one's painful, I got to tell you. This is very painful, this next... No, I mean it. I'm really sad about this next slide. Um, I asked a mutual friend of ours if he would please speak to her and have this pulled off of her website. It's not happened yet. Look, first of all, listen. Is God's judgment coming on America? What do you think the answer to that is? Of course it is. God says, I'm going to judge all nations. And America qualifies big time for a big discipline big time. We're not denying that. Unfortunately, the next verse is Joel 2, 31. The sun will be turned into darkness before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's from Joel. Okay, that verse, that chapter is the latter half of the tribulation period that's yet coming. Oh, I don't know if I can read this. A few years ago, I was teaching through the book of Joel when the ancient words of his prophecy came up off the page. Fantastic. Good. I knew with their, I can't read that, rising certainty that God's severe judgment was coming on America. I agree. I have taught Joel several times since. Each time has served to confirm with deep conviction that God is warning America uh, of impending disaster and destruction. Okay, well, you Google it later. You can read it. And you should read it. Because I almost have nothing to pick a problem with in her article. Because I know her heart is to draw America to repentance. Amen. Unfortunately, right in the middle of the page is a YouTube clip that she endorses. And you can click on, it's, it's just below uh, the, the screen. And, and it's, it's, you can click on it. Don't do it right now, because I want to show you something. Do it later, though. Definitely do it tonight. And he's, she's endorsing this Bible teacher. And it's a disaster. The guy believes that we're halfway through the tribulation period. And it's just off the charts insanity. Now, this is the map of the eclipse path of totality going across the United States, as I mentioned, on August 21st, 2017. It's going to start on the West Coast. The zone of totality will arrive on the West Coast at 1716 hours, 16 minutes, all right? 1700 hours, 16 minutes. So 1716 UT time, that's universal time. This will overlap the Cascadia subduction zone. And what's interesting about this, two things. First of all, that it starts by crossing an earthquake zone. And Jerusalem, at that moment, is plus 2 UT time. So 1716 plus 2 is 1916 or 716 p.m. Why is that important? Because that just so happens to be the exact minute of sunset. So the sun goes dark in America and the sun goes dark in Jerusalem at the same time. Happens every day. At the same location, obviously. <laughs> But that's pretty poetic, if not prophetic. He points out that it crosses one earthquake subduction line. It crosses nearly 20 other ones as well. Okay, next, final one. And then you look at this earthquake hazard map, which is put out by the USGS. You can see the Cascadia is there, starting on the left side. Yellowstone is another hot spot. And then they found that there's another surprising earthquake zone called now the New Madrid. Surprising because it's right in the middle of the country. You wouldn't think that it'd be there. Now take a look at this. If you impose, superimpose the path of totality over the earthquake hazard zones, it's like a, like a perfect match. Starts from one subduction zone and goes over to the New Madrid zone. This is FEMA's 
earthquake projected earthquake damage zones. The red would be the worst. Yellowstone's right there, sitting. New Madrid's there, <laughs> and the sun marks it out. On the 21st of August, the sun says, we're crossing all of those earthquake zones. Okay. All right. You can watch that at length on, on, on that website I told you about. You need to watch it because it gets much worse from there. <laughs> Look, we live in a place where there's earthquakes. We're going to have big earthquakes. The earth has earthquakes. And if you live in Southern California, that's part of your, your mortgage payment is that you pay for big earthquakes here. But when you watch that whole 45-minute teaching on it, it's all about the world being, America being radically affected on August 21st, and the September 23rd date being leading up to, if, if not beforehand, between the 21st and 20, from August 21st to September 23rd, the rapture. Now listen, people will say, oh, you know what though, you know, you, it's, these are these indicators, these are signs. Those, those, the eclipse is not a sign. Unless there's an eclipse without natural definition. And agreed, America is ripe for judgment. And it is coming. But we won't have to guess when it comes. The Lord will make it clear. You, you don't judge a nation. Notice all throughout the Bible, God says, I'm going to judge you guys because of this. And when it comes, they know that they're being judged because of their sins. People don't, don't want to wander around saying, do you think maybe? He announces it. He makes it very clear. But when you watch these things, there's people you and I know who say, I don't, you Christians are crazy. I agree with them. And then you want me to, if I don't know the gospel and you're telling me this stuff, well, you should believe in Jesus because there's going to be an eclipse on October, to, uh, August 21st. So what if I don't believe in, in the eclipse? I don't, what if I believe nothing's going to happen? Do I still need your Jesus? You see, you don't link those things together. These speculations should be reserved to the coffee table, not put up for the world to make fun of. And Isaiah says that they are forecasters and they're diviners. And God says, I take the wise men's words and I turn them back. He says, I, make, I wind up making their knowledge foolishness. Pure speculation. And yet, it's, when it's done in a pulpit, it's terrifying. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I believe in signs and wonders, all of them. I just believe they're from God. And I believe they will be signs and wonders to where your jaw... <gasps> That's what makes it a sign and a wonder. <laughs> okay? And um, anyway, look at verse 26. Who confirms the word of his servant. Sounds specific, Yeah? And performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, You shall, this is amazing, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of Judah, you shall be built. I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up your rivers? Stop right there for a second. Look at that market in your Bible. Isaiah is speaking and saying that Israel or Jerusalem is going to be inhabited and built. Ladies and gentlemen, while Isaiah is prophesying, Jerusalem was a paradise on earth. It was heavily populated. It was glorious. It was prosperous. It was the desire of other nations to conquer her. Do you hear this? It was built. It was spectacular. That's why Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus and everybody wanted it. And Isaiah prophesies to them and says, it's going to be built. And they must have looked at him and thought, are you crazy? Look around. Do you hear this, everybody? This is remarkable prophecy. And it's about to get more remarkable. I'm running out of time. Verse 28, who says of Cyrus, circle the word, the name Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. They're scratching their head. Number one, Jerusalem is intact. It's beautiful. Isaiah, are you nuts? And Cyrus, who's Cyrus? Isaiah, God, God speaking through Isaiah, mentions Cyrus' name 150 years before the man's born. 
announces the man's name. Quickly, look in chapter 45. We can't stop. I got three minutes. Thus, look at chapter 45. There's no chapter breaks in the original Old Testament. So keep reading. <laughs> Verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. Circle the word anointed. Only time in the Bible that the anointed is referring to a Gentile. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're Jewish, this drives Jewish scholars crazy that the God of the Bible calls a Gentile anointed one. It's reserved for the Messiah. Cyrus is not the Messiah like you and I think, but God is going to use this guy named Cyrus in the future to deliver Israel like a Messiah. Again, this is written in 7, Isaiah in 7, 701, 715. Listen to this. Cyrus is not yet born. Remember, when you count the Old Testament dates, it goes down to, are you with me? It goes down in number. Whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose, that is, this is an awesome word, it means to put fear in the hearts of the armor of kings. To open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. If you want to see this fulfilled, you can read later. Here's your homework. Read Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar is in his party room, remember? With all the gold and goblets and stuff from the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had torn down. And he's now the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. It's the famous... Uh, the, you, ever, you ever heard the writing, the handwriting on the wall? It's from that chapter 5, where a hand appears and writes on the wall. Mini, mini, teka you farsen. You've been weighed in the balances, king, and you've been found lacking. And that night, the Bible says, it's awesome, read it later. It's, a, it's an amazing moment, because the, the 1,000 of his leaders are all drunk, having a party, and they're making fun of having, having been uh, conquered years ago, Israel, or in Jerusalem, the temple, and they're partying with the temple cups and goblets and all that stuff, and the hand appears and writes on the wall, and it says, your kingdom, you've been judged, and your kingdom is taken away from you. Basically, you lightweight, you're nothing but an aberration, you're an empty suit, and God's judging you tonight. And while he's partying, Cyrus, Cyrus is upriver on the Euphrates River. He's a Persian. He's an Iranian, Persian. He's upriver while the Babylonians are partying. He has a general who diverts the river. The river level drops. But when you're drunk in a party, you don't know. There were massive bronze gates, wood and bronze gates that, that were suspended over the Euphrates River. When Babylon wanted to receive trade in goods, they'd open up the gates and you'd float it right in. It's fantastic. We do that in LA if you think about it at the harbor. Bring in the goods, right? Shut the gates. Nobody. Listen, while they were drinking, Cyrus, they dry up the river. The gates were literally, this is recorded in, natu in, in history, secular history, and you can read about it at the British Museum. While they were partying, the gates were not locked because they were all drunk. The river dips. Cyrus and his soldiers come in, push the gates open, walk up the riverbed. History tells us that S S Persia had conquered the city of Babylon, and they had control of it for 16 days, and the Babylonians didn't even know it. He conquered the city without a battle. Famous King Cyrus. He's legendary. You can look him up later. God's, God tells Cyrus, I'll open. he wasn't even born yet. S listen, according to Jewish history, when Cyrus showed up to Babylon and wound up conquering, Daniel was there. The Bible records that Daniel was still alive. But according to Jewish history, this is not in the Bible, but according to Jewish history, Daniel shows Cyrus when he's, when he's there. Daniel, the old man, now he's close to 90 years old. Daniel shows Cyrus. You're in the Bible. You're right here. And he shows him Isaiah and Jeremiah. Cyrus is mentioned nearly 30 times in the Old Testament. Written, and the guy, can you imagine it's you later? You show up 150 years later and your name is in the Bible and it tells you how you're going to attack the city. 
And Cyrus, according to world history, saw that, and he said, that's it. Your God is the God of heaven. This is God's city, and I'm going to spare it. And Cyrus wound up being, as it were, the anointed one, the Messiah. He saved the Jews and, and allowed them to rebuild their city, and he was very good. That's why many people today, if you're, if you're a Gentile and you're good to Israel, you might get a nickname like Cyrus. Oh, we have to end. Go to the, I tell you what, tonight, before, go to the British Museum tonight in London, and you can read all about it. Father, we thank you for your words. Wow, oh God, and Lord, let us be people who are not uh, led by our feelings and by what we want to hear, but by what your word says. Lord, these are amazing hours, and we pray that you come back tonight. But if you don't, give us the, give us the spirit to fight for tomorrow for truth. And Lord, may we stand firm in your word revealed to us that we don't have to make stuff up. There will be earthquakes, there will be floods, there will be eclipses, there will be wars, there will be uh, diseases, all these things your word tells us in advance and have always been. Yet we do, we do not discredit the fact that we are more nearer to meeting Jesus now than ever before. May we trust in him and him alone. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the call. In Jesus' name and all God's people said,